We're so glad that, to have you here. I wanted to start our time by, by reading some, some verses from 2 Timothy uh, that capture the heart of why it is that we do this. This is such kind of a, a weird thing in our culture that we'd get together for uh, four hours on a Saturday and talk about a book. Uh, but these words capture well uh, uh, Paul's words to Timothy. He says, he says this, He says, indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted, while evil people and imposters will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man or woman of God may be, may be complete, equipped for every good work. And that's our heart for a day like today, is that we would uh, see God uh, and experience his nature as we open up his word and as we study together, as we learn more about what it's saying, as we as we hear from Dr. Mackey teach about the first five books of the Bible, uh, our hope is that this would not just be a gathering of information, but that we would actually experience this morning, and as we go away from here, as we ponder, we'd actually experience transformation in our hearts, that we would feel equipped for the mission that Jesus has called us to. And so, um, 1 Timothy 3, I think, says it best. That scripture is useful to us, and I hope that you experience that this morning as, as Dr. Mack, <clears throat> Dr. Mack he teaches us. Let me pray, and then I'll introduce him. Pray with me. God, we uh, are grateful to be here this morning. What a privilege it is to sit in a room like this. Uh, with a bunch of people and to study your word. I know that uh, all over the world, this isn't a, a, re a reality, that this is actually uh, hard to do in many places for our Christian brothers and sisters. And so we just are thankful to you for this chance. Spirit, would you uh, now soften our hearts? Would you uh, protect us from the evil one? Would you just... Uh, break us free from any darkness, any, anything that might be trying to overwhelm our souls. Would you just free us from that and, and soften us to really hear from, from your word, uh, to be renewed uh, in the strength of your might. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Dr. Tim Mackey uh, graduated from Multnomah, got his undergrad from Multnomah, and he's a uh, went on to Western Seminary and eventually got his PhD in Jewish and Hebrew studies from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. Uh, and ever since then, he's been uh, teaching and, and involved in the church. Uh, one of the things that we love to do is we don't just like to bring uh, people that know a lot about the Bible, but we like to, to have people that care about the church and are deeply invested in the church. And, and Dr. Mackey is no exception to that. He is uh, been involved in the church for many years now, uh, utilizing the gifts that God has given him to, to further his kingdom. Uh, and he's married to Jessica, his wife, for how long? 15 years. Sweet. And they have two boys, uh, Roman and August, and they're four and six. Uh, he's the co-founder of the Bible Projects. Uh, many of you have seen those videos, and we've been uh, showing them here for a while. He, he co-founded that and is uh, involved in that ministry full-time uh, now as he uh, impacts the world through the gifts that God has given him. So uh, welcome up, Dr. Tim Mackey. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. How are you guys? Happy Saturday. Um, it's really great to 
uh, be here with you guys. Um, I know uh, a handful of people from this church community through other uh, connections, um, through Western Seminary. But uh, man, I haven't been to the F greater Phoenix area. Is that what people say? <laughs> Since I was 10, I had an uncle who lived here. He doesn't anymore. He lived in uh, Mesa. But uh, the only thing I remember from being here 30 years ago um, was the cac cacti. And uh, they're quite large. I took a picture by the one in the parking lot to send to my boys because they're really into this book about desert cactus right now. Anyway, uh, happy Saturday. You guys, you could be doing a lot of things right now. You could be doing a lot of things. I don't know if you do things outside when it's hot like this. <laughs> I would be. Uh, we've had a very late spring that's cold in Portland, so uh, this was glorious. Um, so, so, But I don't know what you would be doing otherwise, but the fact uh, that you chose, you self-selected to be in a room uh, exploring and reading and thinking about the first five books of the Old Testament for like four hours. That's so nerdy. <laughs> you guys are total nerds, and, uh, but that's great. Um, that's great. Yeah, and I'm joking. I, I uh, am a card-carrying Bible nerd too, and uh, we, should, we should be proud of that. So cheers. This is great. This is my idea of a good time. Um, uh, our goals are modest to explore the first five books of the Bible. It's a, a mere 500 pages or so uh, in your Bible. But uh, yeah, the, the goals are not modest. Uh, but the reason for why we're going to do that much of the Bible in just a few hours, I'll kind of uh, talk about the reason why. And I, and I think it'll make sense to you. It makes all, all the sense in the world to me. Um, but yes, there you go. Um, so um, I, I met Jesus... Uh, when I was uh, 19 years old through the outreach uh, ministry of a church to skateboarders in the Portland area, they built a skate park uh, covered. It's important in Portland. They built it uh, in the back parking lot. And uh, I started going when I was 16 and because it was a dry place to skateboard. And all you had to do was put up with the Jesus talk every time you went to the park. And so whatever, they shut down the park midway through the evenings and give a Jesus talk. And if you want to skate... Um, in the park, after the Jesus talk, you have to sit through the Jesus talk. And if you skip out on the Jesus talk, which people did, you can't skate. You can't skate until you come back the next week and sit through the Jesus talk to skate. In the, and it's kind of this thing, and everybody respects the rule. And, uh, and so f uh, for years, uh, I have sat through the Jesus talk and uh, the, the teachings of Jesus, the stories about him and... and how he treated people, what he was able to do for people, and then what he did as the culmination of his whole mission. You know, it has a way of messing with people when you just hear the stories uh, in his sayings. And so um, that began a, a journey for me 20 years ago um, to both following Jesus and then the community, uh, the guy who started uh, that skateboard outreach ministry, had virtually the whole New Testament memorized. He was the first Bible nerd that I met, and um, he had a radical conversion in his uh, teenage years, and he did love Jesus, and he loved skateboarding, and he was doing this outreach. And so uh, he is the one, his name's Paul Anderson, and he's the one uh, who first got me interested in reading the Bible, but it was, I was interested in the Bible because of Jesus. And um, that, that was just my experience. And so I'd, I never had any Bible baggage <laughs> or like issues I had to get over from whatever, a childhood of being immersed in Bible or children's literature about the Bible. Um, to me, I was just reading the Bible as a 20-something for the first time because I think Jesus is incredible and he's changing my life. And so that's been my journey uh, with these texts and with Jesus and with the first Five, five books of the Bible. Um, and the reason why I, I preface with that uh, is, is because I've come in years of teaching and in ministry and so on, I've come to see that many people experience uh, especially the Old Testament in a very different way than I came to experience it. 
Uh, many people, if you're raised in the, in the culture of Western churchianity, <laughs> as I call it, right? It's a kind of church culture uh, in America. Um, you are likely exposed to the stories in the first five books of the Bible at a very young age. Um, almost certainly, it was an adapted version of the story that took out all the sex scandals and the violence uh, and all the really odd disturbing things. Are you with me? You guys know what I'm talking about? Yeah. So... And so, and, and so you're raised, and you, and you think you know these stories. And then you have eventually, you're prompted at some time to actually read the, the real stories, and you're just like, what is happening right now? <laughs> right? There's like a, there, and there's amazing stories, like Noah and the animals and this, or Adam and Eve in the garden, and Abraham. But then there's like crazy things, sex scandals happening with wine in dark caves at night. Genesis 20, anybody? And so, are you guys with me? That was the end of Genesis 19. Like weird, weird stuff. And somebody goes into a village and kills everybody mercilessly. And it's, what is happening? And so he, I, my hunch is that many of us have a, a more tortured relationship with the first five books of the Bible. Um, the illustration from my own life, it wasn't my uncle who lived here in Mesa, but my, uh, my own kind of at-home illustration uh, for the Old Testament is I think many of us relate to the Old Testament the way you relate to a strange uncle in your family. <laughs> Namely, that they're in your family. You're supposed to like them. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and you, you have periodically, because of holidays and whatever annual family rhythms, you spend time with this person. And sometimes they act very normal and they give you gifts, right? <laughs> or they say things and it's helpful and they like gave you a band-aid when you fell on your bicycle when they came to your house for Easter or something like that, whatever. So they're your uncle. But then other times they're super weird. They say strange stuff. They smell bad. They like are... And, and so you have this relationship with your uncle <laughs> that you love but are also repulsed by them at the same time. And if, with your honor, if you're honest, um, you're more uncomfortable than you are comfortable around them. Now, I'm not going to do a show of hands, right? <laughs> Say if that's how you feel about the Old Testament, but I know for a fact that that's true for at least many of you. Because um, it's true for m most of the people in the church community where I've, two church communities where I served as a pastor for many years, um, is that, uh, you know, we're down for Jesus, and Jesus quotes a lot from his Bible, which is what we call the Old Testament. It's very important to him. I'll highlight that. Uh, in a way similar to what Kyle did in just a moment. So we know it's important, but, and sometimes we go to these texts of the Old Testament, especially in the first five books, and it's amazing. It's really profound, incredible character of God, His covenant promises, all this kind of thing. But then there's all, half of it is filled with stories that we have no idea what to do with and bloody animal sacrifices, and bodily fluids, and this. You're, are you with me here? It's the Old Testament. And so, and so I think what we end up doing is just coming to peace with having that awkward relationship. And, um, you know, sometimes your weird uncle tells you about bloody animal sacrifice and, and sex in a cave, and you're like, well, I don't, what, Genesis 19? What is, why is this happening to me? Oh, I'll just turn to the New Testament, right? And so, you, and that's our way of dealing with it. Um, or over time, we just simply treat the Bible as if the first three quarters doesn't exist. Maybe the book of Psalms, because that's pretty sometimes. But uh, I think for most of us, that's, uh, if we're honest, that's, that's where we end up. And that's a, that's a, a, a tragedy. It's a tragedy. It really is. Um, reading the Bible, Old and New Testament, it's always a cross-cultural experience. It's like going to another country. Uh, it was written in a different language, a different time, a different place. And so there's a lot of it that uh, is about over overcoming uh, those hurdles and learning to live in a different culture, the culture of the Bible and its world and way of speaking and telling stories and so on. Um, but then another uh, piece of it is learning how a, a book like uh, the Torah communicates. Um, here, so let me give an illustration. I think of um, a visual illustration of what, what many of us experience, especially when we're reading the first five books of the Bible, but much of the Old Testament. Uh, have any, any of you ever seen uh, these things called photo mosaics, where it's a large picture made up of hundreds of little tiny photos? Have you seen these before? Maybe you have. Um, so here's one up close. 
And um, I tell me what you see. <laughs> what do you see? Animals. Yes. Uh, yes. My teaching style is when I ask questions, I actually mean them as questions <laughs> to be responded to, just so you know. Okay. So what do you see? You see animals. Can you make out what kind? The resolution isn't killer. Yeah, notice the polar bear theme here in the white section. The seal. You see the night birds over there on the left? There's like owls and, uh, yes, it's polar bear. Yeah, okay. So we'll back, back it up a little bit. So this is where we were. Can you make anything out? Oh, you see fish. <laughs> where do you see the fish? Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of owls, a guy with his dog, it's a snake. Also, but do you also see, um, close up, do you see uh, a couple random pictures of books, open books, pages? What's that, what? What does that have to do with anything? Those aren't animals, that doesn't fit. Now, if, if you start to see the picture emerging, don't tell your neighbor, right? Just keep it to yourself. Until, any, any, any clarity here? Any? Anybody? Raise your hands if you see something emerging. Okay, about half of you. And the other half, you're like, dang it, really? Why not? <laughs> Do you remember those 3D pictures at the mall that you had to do that thing? Yeah, it's like that. And maybe you might have pretended that you could see it, but even though you couldn't, yeah. All right, so don't you need to pretend. All right, we'll do one more. So I don't know if you, there's animals, there's, and there's pictures of books. What? Do you see it? Do you all see it? Yeah, it's the face of Jesus. Yeah, crown. <laughs> do you see? It's the crown. It's the, the Jesus with the crown of thorns. Do y'all do see it? Yeah, the nose. You see the nose? All those owls are the shadow of the right side of his face and the shadows. Um, the... The, little, the polar bears are part of his nose, as it turns out. His lips were made up of a seal on the beach. <laughs> but uh, there you go. Isn't that cool? I really like these. Now, I, they might be overplayed now at this point. There are free websites you can go and upload your whole photo library and then like just make, make your own and so on. But um, So uh, let's just pay attention to what happened, what happened there. You, uh, when you were at super close uh, view, zoomed way in, all you saw was individual little scenes of a polar bear and a bat or an owl or the pages of a book. And it's interesting, but you don't, you don't have any sense of how these relate to each other in any kind of meaningful pattern. Are you with me? And so you, you probably have a hunch that there is some overall pattern, but you don't know what that is, and so you're just lost. And then, as you spend more time with the image, and as you think, think the things that you thought you understood already, once you see them in a larger setting, fitting into a pattern, and then all of a sudden you begin to see a shape emerge. And then that shape's communicating to you something way bigger than any of the individual little pieces. And then all of a sudden you realize every single image has been intentionally placed and makes its unique contribution, but right then in, in that spot. I guess tracking with me here. Um, I, would, I would submit to you that this is precisely how the uh, Old Testament, I'm going to shift over calling it the Hebrew Bible. Um, that's just my, uh, what I call it um, for reasons that we'll talk about later. But the Hebrew Bible, Old Testament, uh, this is precisely how these texts have been designed. Um, the Old Testament... Uh, is is one of 
it's absolute literary genius uh, how this thing has been designed as an act of communication. Um, when, and it's precisely this v intentional overall design with every little tiny piece fitting into its place and making its contribution. Um, if you begin to pay attention to how Jesus interacts with his Bible, which is what we call the Old Testament, how he quotes from it, how he alludes to it, how he draws language and imagery from it, uh, you'll, it'll become clear that this is precisely how he sees the Old Testament scriptures, as a unified collection of lots of very different kinds of material, but all uh, fitting into this pattern and design that he said points to him, that is about him. Um, Kyle read one text, but let's um, just look at another. Uh, Luke 24, 44. This is uh, Jesus post. Can you all read that? Let's do a little bigger. Um, this is Jesus post resurrection. Uh, his uh, disciples uh, are gathered in a room, and uh, the two from the, the road to Emmaus, if you know the story, they encountered Jesus but didn't know it at first. And they're having this conversation about our, our friend and rabbi died. It's tragic. <laughs> and, he, and Jesus was like, Oh, what happened over the weekend? Right? <laughs> He's like, Well, oh, Jesus of Nazareth, he died, and we thought he was going to redeem Israel, and he didn't. He didn't. And, um, so, anyway, so later on, he um, sh shows up in this room. Uh, verse, chat, Luke 24, verse 36. So they're talking about how they just sought Jesus alive from the dead. And then Jesus is there, he's just there. It's very clearly doesn't say he entered the room. It just says, and he was there, standing there, saying, Shalom, Shalom, hey guys. And they were freaked out. They thought they were seeing a ghost. And he said, why, what's the problem here? Oh yes, you're seeing a man alive from the dead, right? So that's why uh, you would be freaked out right now. But you guys, it's me, look, it's me, touch me. See, a ghost doesn't have a body. And he showed them his hands and his feet. And while they still couldn't believe it because of their joy and amazement, he said to them, so classic, man, I'm hungry. <laughs> Do, you, Do you guys have anything to eat? So they gave him some fish. Brilliant. So here's Jesus. And you can imagine, if you've ever been the only person eating at a table, the mouth noises and the silverware noise, right? And everyone's staring at you. How awkward the scene would be. They're staring at him, and Jesus is eating right in front of them, it says. And then, so imagine he's got his mouth full of fish. You guys, <laughs> I told you all this was going to happen. <laughs> These are the words that I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms, it had to be fulfilled. And then uh, he apparently spent the next, we don't know how long, doing a survey through the Old Testament scriptures, referring to all of the things that he said were fulfilled, were fulfilled in him. Um, so a million things going on here, but this is just one of these. When Jesus thinks of um, the scriptures, he doesn't think of a collection of just a bunch of random stories. He sees a unified whole that has a, th a three-part shape. The law of Moses, the prophets, and then the Psalms. In the traditional Jewish uh, ordering of the Bible, it's ordered into three sections, the Torah, the prophets, and the Psalms. We're just looking at the first third uh, today. But Jesus views uh, his Bible as a unified whole that has one main purpose, to point forward to uh, the coming of the Messianic king, his death, his resurrection, and he goes, well, let's, let's listen. Here's Jesus summarizing what he thinks the Old Testament's about. This is what you should get from when you read the Bible, the first three quarters of the Old Testament. The, the Messiah is going to suffer, rise again from the dead on the third day, and that repentance for forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in his name to all the nations, starting right here in Jerusalem. You all got that when you read the Torah, didn't you? And then the prophets, that's what you all got. It was very crystal clear. 
<laughs> so, and if it's not crystal clear, I think it's for us worth asking the question, like, well, why not? Why isn't that the message I'm getting when I read uh, the Old Testament? It's apparently the message Jesus got. He, and he, this, is, this is how he viewed his Bible, uh, like this, like this. And uh, he trained the apostles that day and in 40 days that followed to read their Bibles like this. Um, I'm just going to turn back to uh, the example that Kyle gave and just look at it real quickly again. This is Paul writing to his protege, young disciple and pastor in Ephesus, Timothy. And he says, you, Timothy, continue reading your Bible and learning the Christian faith and everything you become convinced of because you've known all the people from whom you've learned all this. From childhood, you've been reading the sacred writings. Now, let's pause real quick here. So Paul is writing this. Paul's writing a letter that will be Come a part of the collection of the New Testament. Does the New Testament exist in a nice bound volume that you can buy down at your Greek Barnes and Nobles? You know, what I'm like it doesn't. No, it doesn't exist. But by this time, most of the writings of the New Testament exist, but not all of them yet, and they don't exist in a bound collection. When Paul refers to sacred writings that Timothy's known from childhood, what's he referring to? He's referring to what we call the Old Testament. And what does he say about this? Is it's great. What does he say about the Old Testament? You've been raised on these scriptures, the Old Testament from your childhood, and remember what the Old Testament's about. He says it in one sentence. Here's what the Old Testament scriptures can do. They give you wisdom. It's the first thing he says. What's the purpose of the Bible? To give you wisdom. Wisdom about what? Wisdom about salvation that uh, humanity is in a deep, deep mess <laughs> that we are not getting ourselves out of uh, by our own ingenuity. Wisdom about the heap of a mess that we're in and that there is a, a rescue out of the mess. And how does that rescue take place? Well, I participate in the rescue by trusting through faith. Faith in whom? In the Messiah, Christ, Remember, Christ is not Jesus' last name. He wasn't born to Mary Christ and Joseph Christ. You know this, right? You should know this. So it's a title that means king, anointed king, Messiah. And who is the Messiah? Jesus of Nazareth. So here's Paul's um, su summary. It's very similar to Jesus' summary. Um, salvation through trusting in the Messiah and what the Messiah did for us to save us in a way that we could never save ourselves. And who is that Messiah? Jesus. So uh, aside from the name Jesus of Nazareth, which of course uh, well, actually was known, it was the name of Moses' protege, Joshua. It's Joshua in the Old Testament. But here you go. This, that's the summer, Paul's summary of the Old Testament. You, did you all get that when you read the Old Testament last time? Wisdom about salvation through faith in the Messiah? Apparently, Paul thinks you ought to have. In fact, this, this is what you should know from childhood. Not who built the ark, Noah, Noah. You know what I'm saying? So Noah, Noah's one, you should know. I'm, I'm actually being quite serious. And for me, this is a big deal. I have, little, I have little boys, and I'm trying to help them learn the story in a way that I don't have to help them unlearn a whole bunch of things. When, are you with me? In their 20s. So they have to like relearn what they ought to have been able to learn and what Timothy apparently was able to learn very from a very early age. What's the Old Testament about? It's giving you wisdom. It's growing your mind and your heart so that you know that you need to be rescued and that we all need to be rescued and that the only way is to trust what God has done through sending his Messiah. And who is that Jesus? Of okay, all right. I could ride this horse for a long time. Do you get my point here? G according to Jesus and to Paul. And so what I um, would like to do is just spend the rest of the morning reflecting on what does it mean to read uh, just the first five books of the Bible, the, the Torah, um, w with looking for this? And how is it that you s see the Torah as a unified story pointing to our need for salvation through faith in the Messiah? That's what Jesus and Paul got out of 
the Old Testament, and, and, they, and specifically the Torah. Um, and so here's, uh, at least it's become my conviction, is that for, for uh, nobody's malicious here, I think most of us um, in church communities and in, if you're taught the habit of encountering the Scriptures, what we're taught to do um, is encounter the Bible in a, in a way that only exposes us to one to five pictures at a time in any given moment. Um, so whether that's in a worship gathering, there'll be a sermon, or you go to a class and there's the teaching, and so you encounter a story or a psalm or a section of Proverbs or maybe a, a few stories of a book of the Bible. And that's awesome that you need to do that. Um, but there's not very many settings where we step back and think, why is that story next to that story? And why is those two stories next to the stories before them and after them? And how do they fit into the stories within that whole book? And then how did that book fit into... Are you with me? That's a different way of reading and thinking about the Bible um, that I'm convinced is absolutely necessary because it's, it's a part of following the design of the authors and how they're trying to, how they're trying to communicate. And so, uh, on your handout, you have at the top... Um, a little thing that just says our approach. Big story, little story. There's many things you could do by spending a morning in the Torah. Here's the thing that we are going to do. Um, uh, we're going to constantly be paying attention to the overall storyline and the literary architecture, the literary design, meaning not just paying attention to individual stories, and, how, and what their message is, but to ask, why is this one next to this one? And why is this one first? Why is this one 14th? And why are those connected to these? And how do they connect to this one? And once you start learning how to meditate on the scriptures, Psalm 1, meditate day and night. How do you, once you learn how to meditate, both by reading the hundreds of individual little stories and psalms and prophecies and proverbs, and then also learning to spend as much time reflecting on how they're arranged into the larger story. Boom. Light bulbs. At least for me. And, uh, and I, hope, I hope for you too. So that's what essentially we're going to do with the rest of our time. Uh, is dive into a handful of individual texts that kind of guide the overall design of the whole story of the Torah. And um, when we finish, we're going to come back to Luke and to Paul and I, I hope have a better sense of the kinds of things they were paying attention to um, when they read the first five books of the Bible. How you guys doing? Perfect, perfect. Um, okay, let's uh, do this. If, if we're going to, um, where should we start? Page one is a great place to start. So whether uh, you uh, turn your Bible on or open your Bible, whatever you do to access a Bible, I invite you to do that. And uh, as we go, um, I know th that this won't g give you super clear vision, especially for those at the back, but I'm going to have a drawing uh, of the literary design of the Torah uh, that will emerge as we go throughout the morning, and um, ho hopefully that can be helpful, helpful to you too. So let's first pay, we're going to start at the beginning, um, but uh, we're going to walk through the Torah in just four movements. That's what's on your handout right there. Um, there are actually many more, but in the big picture, there's four large movements that I have found very helpful to trace through, uh, trace through the story. Um, it's uh, the, what makes up Genesis 1 to 11, it's a crucially important movement that sets up the problem to which the rest of the Bible is the solution. Uh, then there's the rest of the book of Genesis, Genesis 12 through 50. Uh, it's this, uh, a collection of stories about an extremely dysfunctional family <laughs> over three generations. Uh, but each generation uh, has its bright moments, and the best thing these people ever do is nothing and just trust God. That's, that's when they're at their best, people in this family. And then uh, the third collection of stories has to do with the Exodus narrative, the suffering of the people in Egypt and then God rescuing them. So let, let, actually, let's just pay attention to that right there. First off, three movements. Okay, Genesis 1 through 11, Genesis 12 through 50, and then Exodus 1 through 
15. Genesis. Exodus. And let's just pause and reflect on that for a moment. Genesis 1 through 11 tells, as we're gonna, it begins in the beginning, it's as epic a beginning as you could ask for, um, and it tells a story about many generations over long periods of time. It's like a, if, if you were a movie director, the camera would be zoomed way out, and you're watching like the nations and the world and all this kind of thing. It's a very uh, uh, wide zoom lens. And then all of a sudden, in this next collection of stories about Abraham and his family, we, at Genesis 12, we zoom in to the story of just one man and his family for three generations. And it's very close and personal stories about the people from this family. Then uh, the family grows and gets into a really bad situation, and therefore God sends a deliverer, Moses, to rescue them from slavery and to bring down the big bad pharaoh. You've probably seen the movie. So, okay, so let's just stop right there. Think of these are the first three large narrative movements. These get us uh, 65 chapters into the Bible. There's no laws anywhere in sight. Uh, oftentimes, uh, the Old Testament, specifically the Torah, the Pentateuch, gets most associated with what, the Old Covenant or the law. Uh, and it's important to recognize you actually get 68 chapters into the Pentateuch before you ever hit any laws. It's just really exciting narrative uh, leading up to that. But just stop and think about even the design of these three large narrative sections before you get to Mount Sinai and the laws and so on. You're telling a story about world history, everyone and everything. And then you tell a collection of stories about one man and his family. Now just stop right there. That's just pondering that relationship between these two sections is worth a cup of tea and a long walk. <laughs> If you think about it, like if I, were to tell, if I were to tell you a story about the history of the United States leading up to November 11th, 1976, right? Bicentennial year, Veterans Day, and I, I, I gave a long treatment, right, of American history all leading up to Veterans Day, 1976, the country turns 200, and on that day, Tim Mackey was born. And then the rest of the story was the story of my childhood, for example. And let's say that was the story. Are you with me? This is a stupid example, right? <laughs> but, but it works. What? That would, that would, that's a very presumptuous way to tell a story, isn't it? Because what I'm, what I'm implying is that the whole history of the United States was building up towards this. And now this story is going to carry on the story of... The, are you with me? The connection there. Do you, do you guys, that's exactly the claim being made, simply by setting the history of everything alongside the history of three generations of Abraham's family. Something's gone terribly wrong in God's good world, Genesis 1 through 11. What's the only way out of a very dysfunctional family to whom God has made an eternal commitment to, to bless all of the rebellious nations through this one man and his family. How is he going to do that? Well, you have to keep reading, right? But uh, that's exactly what's going on here, is that the stories of Abraham and his family are presented as the way God is at work to solve and address and fulfill all of human history right here. Just, and like you would never, that's just make, uh, that's backing up from the polar bear and the bat, <laughs> and it's saying, oh, I'm beginning to see a a nose emerge here, that it's through the seed of Abraham, as we're going to see, the seed of Abraham, that God is going to restore his blessing to all the rebellious nations. Okay, so um, that, these are the first three sections right here, and uh, I just want to cover this ground right here before our first break. <laughs> A mere 45 minutes, sheesh. Okay, we're gonna, but we're going to do it, trust me, we're going to do it. And there's value there's value in doing a lot of it all in one stroke and in, in just an hour's time. Trust me. Okay. So, um, what I want to do is, when we think about the storyline of the Bible and how it begins, and when we think about the plot conflict driving the whole biblical story, what's the first thing that comes to your mind? 
Um, I think if Jesus is saying the whole story is fulfilled in a crucified Messiah risen from the dead, and Paul says having faith in him because that's salvation, if that's the solution, then what somewhere back here is the identification of the problem to which that is the solution? What is the, the problem that's identified in the story here? And um, it's very important. We're going to look at two uh, texts here on pages one and two of the Bible. Because um, pages one and two of the Bible give us the ideal um, purpose of why God made anything at all. And then how that goes terribly wrong is what sets up the conflict to which Jesus is, is the resolution. So, um, here we go. I'm not going to talk about most of the stuff that people like to talk about on page one of the Bible, it's the controversies and so on. So just, I want to focus in on something that no matter what view you have about Genesis 1, we all agree. And, and here it is. In the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. Now, when you see the word earth, um, ah, when you see the word earth and recognizing you're reading a 3,000-plus-year-old text originally written in Hebrew, <laughs> ancient Hebrew, what should not come into your mind when you see the word earth? A globe. <laughs> Are you with me here? How, how long have human beings even had access to the idea, right? the conception, a visual image of planet earth floating in space? Are you with me? Like 60 years for the first satellite. Photograph. So if you look at this word, Eretz in ancient Hebrew, and all of its uses in the Bible, it means what's under our feet, it's what's down here, the land, the land. And heavens uh, is not the ancient Hebrew word for the universe, it's for what's up there, <laughs> this is sky. In the beginning, God made what's up there and what's under our feet. Deal? <laughs> all right, moving on. <laughs> Now, let's talk about what, what was under our feet. Um, what was under our feet wasn't always a place where human beings could flourish and build neighborhoods and parks and gardens and towns and farms. and You know, like that hasn't always been possible. Um, the, the way that the plot conflict begins or the, the narrative shape of the first two sentences of the Bible is, in the beginning, God made what's up there and what's down here. Happy face? Yes. We love to exist. It's amazing to exist. But, uh, man, life here, uh, what's under our feet? Uh, it was, before God's creative work brought order to it, it was in a state of, and most of our English translations have a phrase here, formless and void. I'm going to have a, another handout up here where I'm just going to teach you Hebrew words because it's awesome. Um, so formless and void. I don't know what uh, comes to your mind. Um, maybe a clay ball undulating in empty space or something like that. That's what came into my mind when I was 20 or reading the Bible for the first time. But um, that's not what's going on here. Uh, it's a, a little phrase in Hebrew. Uh, it rhymes. Brilliant. It rhymes. The phrase is tohu, vavohu. It's good. It's good. Tohu, vavohu. Um, there's a, a Jewish scholar named Everett Fox um, who uh, wanted to both capture the ancient Hebrew meaning of these words and the rhyming or alliteration of this phrase. Um, and he translated uh, this phrase wild and waste, the two W's. Uh, c capturing the tohu vavohu rhythm. Uh, and I like that, wild and waste. And, and I don't just like it because I like it. It's because what these words refer to, they're not used very often in ancient Hebrew literature, but when they are used, they're used to describe um, something that's very similar to what looks like the outskirts of the greater Phoenix area. <laughs> All right? Just desert. Desert, uninhabitable desert. Um, let me just show you one example. This is how you, um, I, I know about this church community that the, you guys care about the scriptures and the, many of you are Bible nerds. Look how many of you are here for goodness sake. So uh, my hunch is that some of you know 
this idea. When you want to know what a word means in any given biblical text, the first thing you do is find out what are all of the other biblical passages where that word occurs, and you look at the, all of the ranges of usage of this word. And so here's a story. It's a poem in Deuteronomy 32. Uh, and Moses is talking about how God found Israel in the desert sands of Egypt suffering um, in their slavery. And this is the line, God, it's talking of God, God found Israel in a desert land in a howling tohu, a wilderness. Tohu, wilderness. So un uninhabitable wilderness. Now this is fascinating. Go back to um, page one of the Bible. And we're told that what's, God made everything way back when, what's up there and what's down here. Now what's down here was in a state of wild and waste and darkness, was over the surface of the deep waters. So what you have is uninhabitable wasteland that's dark and covered with deep, abysmal waters. Now on the surface level, um, once you lock into the fact that wilderness is like a, it's desert, uninhabitable desert, and it's dark, okay, I get that, it's dark in the desert, but then what's covering the desert? Waters? Wait, how can it be a desert that's covered with waters? And, that, and that's precisely the moment um, that we need to, we need to re respect the literary ingenuity of the biblical authors. That they will often do this, and this won't be the last time, even this morning, that it, rightly at key texts they will use words in ways that make you go, what? what? What's going on here? We have to just slow down and let each image and each word carry its weight and paint the broader picture here. What, what kind of, where is Genesis 1 and 2 going to end? What's going to be the end result of God bringing his creative power and, and wisdom? What's going to result? A garden. Can you think <laughs> of any environments that are the exact opposite of a garden that's habitable for humans with food falling off the trees at you. It's like it throws, it, food throws itself at you off of the trees, right? That's the image here. So what's the exact opposite of that? I mean, I actually can't think of a better description, right? right? Land, land that is waste and uninhabitable, dark, and the deep waters. Uh, it's a very common image all right throughout the Old Testament of, of the chaotic danger uh, that is not an inhabitable place by humans. The two most uninhabitable places for an ancient Israelite, the desert and the ocean. <laughs> we don't go to either of those places. Um, that's not where humans uh, belong ultimately. And so that's how uh, the story begins here. In uh, Genesis 1, Is the story goes, I'm just going to use a modern word, but, but I like it because uh, I think it gets at it. Uh, from chaos to order, to order and beauty and life. Genesis 1 and 2. Who's the God revealed to us on Genesis pages 1 and 2 of the Bible? A God who has the desire, the will, the power, the wisdom, the creativity to turn disorder and chaos and darkness in, in environments that are uninhabitable for human flourishing and through without any rivals and by speaking the word disorder and darkness is transformed into order and beauty and life how you guys doing it's pages one and two of the bible at its, at its essence right in a way that everybody disagrees excuse me disagrees everybody agrees on this point. How and how long, welcome to the wonderful debates um, about Genesis 1 and 2 in our modern age, but this is the basic storyline being told here. What is the purpose of God for our world according to pages 1 and 2 of the Bible? What does God want for our world? Order and beauty and life. Now, what does life mean? Life. Well, there's going to be all these creatures uh, inhabiting God's good world, but let's go to The climactic moment of page one, uh, it's the first poem in the Bible. Do you guys know what the first poem in the Bible is? First poem. It's very short. It's a short little poem. <laughs> it 
It's uh, Genesis 1, verse 27. Uh, and you know it's poetry because uh, it's worded both in Hebrew and in English like poetry. Um, biblical poetry is short lines, usually consisting of anywhere from about, in Hebrew it's about three to five words, but it's condensed. Usually it takes about anywhere from five to eight English words <laughs> to unpack those three to five words in Hebrew. Uh, it, and the, usually those lines, it's two or three lines that sound like they're saying almost the same thing, but just slightly differently. It's called parallelism, biblical poetic parallelism. It's the, the key feature of biblical poetry, of short, dense lines that are paired in ways that say the same thing but differ and give you a bigger picture. And here you go. It's very, like nobody argues about this, Genesis 127. And what is... Um, what, what is the first poem in the Bible about? It's about how this God doesn't want to just create this environment for God's own self, uh, but that God, this God wants to share. This God wants to share. And, and how he shares is by creating this particular living creature that is a, a mirror image, so to speak, of God's own self and purpose and characters in the world. The image the image of God. And what is the image of God? Adam. Adam. Okay. So man, mankind, maybe you guys know this already. Um, in some of our English translations, humanity. Uh, in Hebrew, it's the word Adam. Adam. So here on page one, it doesn't, it doesn't mean male human, because the poem's going to be very clear. It's talking about male and female here. So Adam as a species. And so what, what is Adam? That Adam constitutes the image, a mirroring image of God. Oh, yes. Here we go. Image. Did you guys know this? Image is the standard Hebrew word for statue. If you, actually, if you look at survey, its uses throughout the rest of the Hebrew Bible, um, it's one of the most common words for idol statue. This is what um, the Canaanites make of their gods. Selim is the word in Hebrew. Selim. So God, humans aren't to make a Selim of God because God has already made a Selim of himself. <laughs> and it's you and the person sitting next to you. That's the idea here. God installs a mirroring image, a, a being, a living being that's going to represent God to the created world. And what is that being? That being is one Adam, one humanity, that, that, and that one is made up of two, male and female. The one God is imaged by a one creature that is itself two. Come, come now, you guys. Are you with me? There's one, yet more than one at the same time. Are you with me? This is, remember, it's page one of the Bible, you guys, right? And what... What kind of image can, does God make to reflect God's own being? One, yet two. Neither at the expense of the other, both at the same time. And for what purpose? Well, for, uh, next, what does God do for the images? He showers them with blessing. And that's going to get developed on page two with the garden and so on. Uh, but here's the commission the blessing commission God gives to the images. He says, be fruitful and multiply. Make more of yourselves. Fill the earth and subdue it and rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, all the creatures that live on the land. Okay, here you go. You guys, here's the storyline of the Bible. What's the storyline of the Bible about? Who's responsible for the fact that we live in a world that is that's comprehensible, that's ordered, um, that sustains life, and that is ordered and full of beauty. Who's responsible for that? Someone. And that someone is also responsible for the origins and existence of a creature in this world that is both connected to all the other creatures, but yet is also distinct from them, uh, and is a, a creature that rules over the other creatures. Um, when, oh, that's not, 
good. We'll just pretend like that's not happening. Um, so uh, if you're not a Mac user, it's called the wheel of death. Is what that thing's called. <laughs> so <laughs> it didn't kill my computer, so that's good. Um, so uh, yes, a, a being. So what, what, kind of a, what kind of relationship does God have to the elements uh, that he brought order and beauty of life out of? Is God subservient to the tohu vavohu? No, he's its master. Yeah? He, he is able to take the raw potential of all of that tohu vavohu and channel it in a direction it would never go on its own towards beauty and order and life. And then he appoints a creature that is an image of God into the created realm itself. And that creature is given the same task. It's to image what God has been doing on page one is what now humans are to go do, which is to take all of the raw materials and the potential that God's packed into his good world and then to steer it somewhere. This is what subdue means. And this is going to get unpacked in farming imagery, yeah? Agricultural imagery on pages two and, and following. And so it's exactly like if you, have a, if you have an apple tree, does it make food by itself? It's pretty incredible, actually. This food falls off the tree for humans. It's awesome. Um, but with a little ingenuity and a little hard work, what can humans do to that tree that it would never do by itself? The humans can subdue the tree, which doesn't mean chop it down. Humans can rule the tree, which doesn't mean like, I rule you, you know? What does that mean? It means I'm able to do something to the tree to exert my will over it in a way that it actually brings out even greater amounts of life and growth and flourishing. You can grow, humans make an orchard that can grow apples for thousands of people. An apple tree will never do that by itself. It'll grow a few trees and some weeds. You know what I'm saying? So here's the idea here. Exactly what God has been up to on page one of the Bible, God's images are now to do within the created world itself. How you doing? Isn't this a good story? It's such an amazing story. This is the story of humanity in the world. What is humanity here for? Humanity is very unique in God's good world um, with the capability and the calling, a divine calling, to take the world somewhere, to move the story forward, to be fruitful and multiply, and to direct the resources of the created realm towards even greater life and flourishing. That's how the story of the life begins, the story of the Bible begins. All right, so we have God does this, uh, uh, bringing order and beauty and life, and now humans do it. This is something God does, and it's something, I'm just going to say, the images do. The images. Okay. Um, now, if human beings, the story of the Bible is a story about who's going to rule the world. And according to page one, by God's intention, who is supposed to rule the world? Humans under God. Yeah? Who's the ultimate ruler? God. And who's the image, the co-rulers under God's authority and blessing that he loves and blesses? Humans. Okay. Um, now, uh, if you are um, cultivating a, a garden, uh, and just to lock it into the gardening imagery, in Genesis chapter 2, which is a parallel story set aside alongside Genesis chapter 1, it's like the bat set next to the polar bear, right? and you're supposed to ponder the connection and relationship between the two narratives. Um, what humans, the, the parallel of the blessing to rule and subdue in Genesis 2 is um, the God plants a garden and then he commissions Adam, humanity, to cultivate it, to work in the garden and to keep it. Now, if you're cultivating a garden, it's going to require decision-making, isn't it? If you're building a neighborhood, if you're building a city, if you're building a family, building a house, it requires decisions about the, a better, one way to build this house, I think that's good. And then another way to build a house, I think that's not good. How should I raise these children as we're being fruitful and multiply? I think this is the way that's good. How should I not raise them? Yeah, that's the way that is not good. Are you with me? Being human requires moral decision-making. And that's precisely what's introduced uh, in 
chapter 2. There are these trees in the garden. And one of the trees in particular, God says, Here, have a blast. Make more of yourselves. Multiply like rabbits, right? And just take the world somewhere. You're, but there's, there's the one thing. You're going to have to make decisions about how to rule the world. And um, there is a way of defining good and evil that you can take into your own hands that God says, I'm going to ask you not to. I'm going to ask you not to. There is a knowledge of what is good and what is not good that you could seize for yourself and define for yourselves what is good and what is not good. Or there's a level of authority to define good and evil that you're to remain hands off of. Because who knows how to make a really good world, according to page one? Ah, how many times is it repeated that God's capable of making a really good world? <laughs> okay, this is good. This is good. The literary, uh, literary brilliance. Go count how many times the word good appears on page one of the Bible. And Okay, so it's very intentional. So God is the one who knows how to design and provide what is good. And now humans are given a job that is going to require them to somehow discern what is good and what is not good. Are you with me here? So who's going to def who gets to define what is good and what is not good in this world? Well, apparently there is a way that humans could do it that will end poorly. <laughs> yeah? And that's by humans seizing that knowledge for themselves. It will bring death. If humans on their own begin to define what is good and what is not good. But by implication, it's wheel of death again, we're going to ignore it. Um, so, so this is very, very important. We're going to have key vocabulary here. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, get this in red. So we have good and evil. And that good and evil is directly connected to life and death. You guys with me? You can discern between good and evil to live in God's world in a healthy way under God's blessing is to submit to God's wisdom of good and evil because God is the provider and definer of what is good and what is not good. And the moment that human beings seize autonomy to define good and evil on their own, it will introduce into God's good world something that is an enemy to God's purposes, namely death. You guys with me? So you get this neat connection, parallel, between what God intends good and it intends life. He wants humans to rule the world under his wisdom of what is good and not good. And the moment humans take this into their own hands, good and evil, and defining it, it will, it will introduce the opposite of what God wants into the world, death. Welcome to the story of the Bible. It's the, it's the story of a world that has been hijacked, <laughs> a world that's been hijacked. God intended humans to rule the world in the wisdom of God. And what humans end up doing is ruling the world in their own wisdom that is itself uh, has been lured and duped by a, a darker wisdom of a being and a force that is anti-life, anti-human and anti-God. And that being and force uh, is depicted for us on page three of the Bible, this being. This being is going to be given a name as, or a title as the story of the Bible goes on as the Satan or the devil or the evil one. On page three, this being is called the snake, <laughs> the snake. And so here's, I'm just going to summarize very quickly here because we need to, the whole point is to do a large scale sweep here. The whole point is that this being uh, connected with the snake gets humans to think that defining good and evil on their own terms is actually the right thing to do. The serpent convinces them that if they were to define good and evil on their own, that's how to truly become human. Your eyes will be opened, and you will actually become more than human. You will become like God. Now, what's the sad irony here? What's the sad, sad irony they are already images of God. <laughs> and they think that somehow there's some way to exist as human that's even more like a God. 
(laughs) which is way overstepping our boundaries. It's to know good and evil for ourselves and on our own terms. And so, um, you, you know the story. This is precisely what the humans do. They take the knowledge of good and evil into their own hands, and um, what they introduce into God's good world uh, is death uh, and the opposite of life. Now, God, the last key word from pages one through three here, God began all of this, goodness and life, by blessing, blessing the humans, and instead, through this act of rebellion and folly, they bring the opposite of blessing down on themselves, or at least on God's good world, and what is the opposite of blessing? Curse. Curse. Welcome to uh, the first longest poem of the Bible. And here's uh, what God does to the snake. Cursed. You're cursed. On your belly you go. Dust you will eat. The way that the snake moves in the dust becomes this embodiment of its future destiny, which is to eat dirt. Defeat and shame. He's cursing this being that duped humans into embracing their own destruction is destined for destruction. This is remarkable. The first thing God does to disobedient humans is to not curse the humans. (laughs) Do you see this here? It's to curse the thing that duped humans into thinking that embracing our own destruction is the right thing to do. And what, uh, and this connects us to the first, there's a, some of you are thinking, we can't do the whole Bible at this pace. If you want to understand a story, where do you have to really, really go slow? At the beginning, to un- make sure you understand the plot conflict that's going to drive the whole rest of the thing. Okay, so here's uh, God's words to this mysterious being who's just there and who gets the humans to embrace of their own choice, their their destruction. And so you're done for. This serpent, the source of evil and death in God's world, it's going to be destroyed. How? God says, I'm going to put enmity, strife, hostility, between you and the woman, between your seed and her seed. Okay, now, what, uh, seed is a Hebrew word for, it's the same word that gets translated. If you're reading in the ESV or the NIV, it'll have descendants, not the word seed. Um, but it's seed, literal seed as a metaphor for descendants. You guys with me here? Okay, so what, when we say seed of the woman, what does that mean? Interpretation, what does it mean? Descendants, a line of humans, Yeah. So, coming from this moment, out of this moment, in the story, there's going to be humans coming forth. Yep, yep, many of them. Long genealogies, full of, in this first book of the Bible. Um, And that long line of descendants, um, and this seed is going to have hostility with the serpent's seed. Now, on a literal level, (laughs) what would the seed of a serpent be? Baby snakes. <laughs> Baby snakes. You guys, this is not talking about the origins of like human be- humans being scared of snakes. Right? <laughs> All right? So that's, that's reading this. That's, that's, uh, that's like Luke Skywalker encountering uh, Master Yoda on Dagobah before he knows he's talking to a Jedi Knight and he thinks he's talking to a little silly green dwarf. You know what I'm saying? And he doesn't realize he's in the presence of a master. You get... I, Star Wars fans? Anybody? Come on, I was raised on this stuff, right? We, re- we often read the Old Testament as if we're in the room with a, with a old, really old, silly-talking green creature, right? And we, way, we so underestimate the fact we are in the presence of literary brilliance and sophistication and depth. We're not talking about baby snakes here, you guys. Who, who is going to be the seed of the serpent. You have to keep reading. And, and right next to the polar bear and the bat is the next story. What chapter is it? After three comes four. And let's say that's a picture of a seal on a beach. Right? Uh, and Genesis 4 is going to be a story about two brothers, one of them who for some reason that we don't know ultimately why 
the way God relates to them creates jealousy. And what the whole point is going to be about how this brother deals with his jealousy. His name's Cain. And what God tells him is that sin is crouching at your door, waiting to eat you alive. And what does Cain do? He gives in. He gives in to his jealousy, his anger, and it ends up in what? Life or death? Death. Dear reader, do you understand? Right? You have two stories of people facing temptations. On page three, it's what? It's a snake. On page four, it's what? What's crouching at Cain's door? Sin. Why does the Apostle Paul have in his brain, at one moment he'll say, sin. And another moment he'll talk about spiritual evil. And another moment he'll talk about death. It's because he has meditated for his whole life on pages one through four of the Bible. And he knows that the role of the serpent is the same role of sin crouching at Cain's door. And in both cases, what it results in is death. Paul learned to read, Paul learned, just like Jesus, to construct his view of God and the world by meditation on these texts. That's precisely how these work. And so, um, Cain represents someone who becomes the seed of the serpent, someone who gives in to evil. There's going to be humans who give in to evil, but God is going to preserve a line from the woman. And that line from the woman is now all of a sudden called a what? He. <laughs> he. He will bruise you. Who's the you right here? Serpent. And who's the he? Just look earlier in the sentence. He. The seed. There's coming a descendant. So there's going to be, from all the descendants of the woman, there's going to be people who give in to the snake and people who uh, preserve the line of God's purposes. And there's going to be strife and enmity. But there is coming one particular seed who is going to fight against the seed of the serpent? Is he going to fight the seed of the serpent? No. What's he going to fight? The serpent. And what's he going to do to the serpent? Um, he's going to, this word bruise, um, some of your translations have strike. Uh, in Hebrew, the word is shuf. <laughs> Uh, it means to strike. If you have someone's foot shoofing the head of a snake, what's... Are you with me here? We're more than bruising the thing, you know? We're striking... Are you with me? Okay. The moment that you... The moment that he... The seed's going to come and strike the serpent on the head. That means no more serpent. That's what it means, right? No more serpent. But in the precise moment of the seed's victory in striking the snake, what does the snake do to the seed? It's going to shoof the seed. So there's going to come a moment where, this, where from the woman will come a seed, and the seed is going to destroy, it's not going to wage war on other humans who give in to the serpent. What he's going to do is wage war on evil itself. And, and what is going to be the nature of his victory over evil? He's going to crush it by being crushed by it. Do you see what's happening right here? You guys, this is page three of the Bible. And it's an ancient Hebrew poem on page three of the Bible that's telling you God's going to send a deliverer who will be a human who's going to crush evil at its source by being crushed by it. Come now. Come now. <laughs> right? So that's how... And, um, and then what he, what he does not do is curse the humans. What he in, uh, informs the humans is that their environments of family and field are going to be environments that are fraught with pain and difficulty and strife because humans are all now redefining good and evil on their own terms, and that is only going to lead to broken, fractured relationships. And here you go. We've camped out long enough on pages one through three of the Bible. We live in a world of evil, death, and curse, what God wanted to create was goodness, blessing, and life. Problem. That's the problem. 
This, God wants humans to rule the world in the wisdom of God and experience life and blessing. Humans have, have, despite themselves and by their own choice, embraced evil, death, and curse. And so this is the problem to which the rest of the Bible story provides the solution. Um, and, and this is, well, okay, let's just pause right here. You guys with me? Doing good? Okay. And so what the story of Genesis, then 3 through 11, is just a story after story of cascading people giving in to the serpent, whether it's Cain or whether it's Cain goes and builds a city. It's the, it's the picture right next to that. It's maybe, uh, I don't know, a picture of a sparrow or something like that, right, in terms of our photo mosaic. Uh, it's Cain builds a city, and then there's a guy named Lamech, the fourth poem in the Bible, <laughs> is uh, in Genesis chapter 4. It's in verse 7, excuse me, verses, um, Lamech's two wives, here we go, 4 verse 23, and you have Lamech who says, yeah, listen, you know, Cain killed his brother and God protected him seven times over, so... You know, there's this young guy who j um, just slapped me the other day, murdered him on the spot. God will protect me seven times more than Cain. It's an it's a image of humanity cascading into violence and death and evil. Then you get the story of the flood, where all humanity has embraced evil all of the time. And so what God, what God does is unleash the forces of Tohu Vavohu back over his creation, the waters... He washes evil from his world, and there's one lone survivor whom God blesses and protects out of the deluge, and, and that human's name is Noah. And God commissions Noah just as he commissioned the images on page one as a new Adam, a new humanity, to go out and to fill the world. Maybe Noah can do the thing that Adam and Eve weren't able to do, and what's the thing that Noah does next? He plants a garden. Good news. And what does he do in the garden? He gets really drunk. <laughs> and bad stuff happens. And then uh, we get a genealogy. And then the last story uh, in this section is uh, the building of the city of Babylon and its tower. They want to exalt themselves up to the place of God. And so uh, what you get is a story of what could have been amazing it was good, and it could have become so much better, but instead it becomes evil, death, and curse. And then you get story after story of humanity cascading out of control, and it ends in Babylon, Genesis chapter 11. But out of the scattering of Babylon, right after, what comes after the story of Babylon? Your favorite part of the Bible to read, a genealogy. And that genealogy traces all the way back from Eve. If you followed it through, Genesis 3 to 11, it's like a trail of breadcrumbs, follows the seed of the woman all the way to Noah. And then it goes to Noah out through three, his three sons. And there's one particular line that now we're following. It's the line of Shem. And then you get these 10 generations after Shem, and you get to Da, 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 da. Abram, a guy named Abram. And then who is the rest of the book of Genesis going to be about? Abram. This is the, there's the history of humanity, and then Abram. <laughs> Are you with me? So whatever, and then here's what happens. What does God want to do for Abram? Go forth from your country. From your relatives, from your father's house, to the land I'll show you. I'll make you a great nation. I will da, 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 bless you. So what God purposed for all humanity, and humanity has forfeited, has now become a gift that God gives to Abram. You could say it this way. Abram becomes the carrier or the conduit of what God purposed for all humanity but forfeited. And now Abram receives God's purposes for all humanity for himself and his family as a gift. And what God wants to do is make a big family out of him. Now, why does he want to do this? Why does he want to 
make Abram fruitful and multiply and bless him. He wants to make him a great name. What did the people of Babylon want to make for themselves? Make a name for themselves. And he's, God scatters them, but he gives Abram a great name. And then he says this, I don't just want to bless you, I want you to become a blessing. The thing that I'm going to do through you is I, I want this blessing that I, of all humanity that I'm now committing to you and your family, I want it to flow through your family back out. And I will bless those who bless you. And those who curse you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, what do we know about all the families of the earth, according to pages 3 through 11? How are they doing in the world? It's bad. They've made themselves enemies of the Creator. They've hijacked God's good world. And so what God is doing is said, what is God's ultimate long-term response to a world of nations and families of nations that have hijacked God's world and rebelled against God? What's God's response? He sets in motion a plan to bless his enemies. Just stop and just ponder. What is it? Are you with me? This remark, I feel like I heard somebody say a line about blessing your enemies once. Right? Where did Jesus get the idea that the character of the Father is to bless his enemies? He's reading his Bible. Because <laughs> that's precisely the architecture of these stories. Is the families of the earth have rebelled, and God sets in, mo in motion a plan to bless them through the family of Abraham. And so we have all of these things come together here. We had God wants goodness and life and blessing, and he's going to bring that about through the line of Abraham, and it's all about the seed. That promised seed of the woman, Abraham and his family are now the carriers of that promise. That's how this story works. Let me just uh, summarize a whole bunch of things by reading a quote from an outstanding Hebrew Bible scholar uh, named Christopher Wright. You'll see it on your handout or here on the screen. And uh, the way that the screen capture went makes the letters really small. So I'm going to zoom in on them here. Okay. Christopher Wright. Uh, he summarizes what's going on this way. He says, The whole Bible can be portrayed as a very long answer to a very simple question. What can God do about the sin and rebellion of the human race? Genesis 12 through the end of the Bible is God's answer to the problem posed by the bleak narratives of Genesis 3 through 11. Or, here's another way to say it. Genesis 3 through 11 sets the problem that the mission of God addresses from Genesis 12 onward. Genesis 1 through 11 poses a cosmic problem to which God must provide a cosmic answer. The problem so graphically spread before the reader in Genesis 1 through 11 won't be solved just by finding a way to get human beings to the good place not, instead of the bad place after they die. That, that will be part of how the solution takes place, but that won't solve the problem that you have God's good world hijacked by hostile powers. That problem has to be solved. And that's precisely what, well, let, let, I'll let the man finish. The love and the power of the Creator must address not only the sin of individuals, but the strife and hostility of nations. Not only the needs of humans, but the suffering of the animals and the curse on the ground. And the call of Abraham is the beginning of God's answer to the evil of human hearts, the strife of nations, and the groaning brokenness of his whole, whole creation. Somebody say amen. amen. Yes. So it's crucially important. Like this, when we think of what it means for Jesus to, or Paul to say this story gives you wisdom about salvation through faith in the Messiah Jesus, it starts to be... I, already knew, I could already read that sentence and understand what it means. But then I begin to realize, like, oh, I didn't actually quite... I didn't grasp nearly how much wisdom this gives me to understand who Jesus was and why he came and why he did what he did. Jesus is the seed of Abraham who's coming to undo and crush the head of the serpent while at the same time being crushed by it. And all of a sudden, the story of Jesus makes so much more sense. It, it was already amazing and could compel a teenage skateboarder. 
you know, who had no reference point for any of this. But then once you read the story to which the story of Jesus is the fulfillment and you see the whole photo mosaic, it's you're like, Jesus, Jesus is unbelievable. He's unbelievable. He's worth giving your life to, in my humble opinion. And, and learning what it means to, to live the life of faith in the salvation that he's provided for me as Israel's Messiah and as the, as the seed of the woman. Okay, um, we're exactly where I want to be, and uh, it's 10 o'clock, which means that your bladders probably need a break, and, uh, and my mouth needs a break, at least for a few minutes. So we're going to pause, and then, is a good story so far? It's great. We're going to move quicker now that we've uh, done the most important, really important part, but there you go. We're going to, 15? Are we doing 15 minutes? Is that the deal? Okay, 10, 15. I'll see you guys uh, back in here.